so lovely for me to welcome our next guest. Um, this person's near and dear to my heart. She's such a lovely, amazing teacher. She's got 20 years of experience. Um, she and I both come from, you may not know this, Christian family. My, fa my father is a pastor. We both undergone traumatic accidents. We both come from a academic background and um, taught in universities. And we both live in kind of small erudite enclaves. Uh, I'm in Charlottesville and she's in Ann Arbor. And we both got certified at the same time. And most importantly, we're both the same height on Zoom, which is a <laughs> <laughs> uh, On uh, Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> to welcome uh, Angela Jamison to our practice and process series. So thank you. Thank you um, for your supportive, loving friendship over years. Uh, this is, this month is the first time I've said yes to invitations to speak publicly. And yours was the first one I said yes to because I knew I'd, well, this is just a different time. You know, up until recently, it hasn't been helpful to be really public about work, but now we're in this weird liminal time of super connection. Um, so I'm just really glad that you're the person holding the space as I make this venture into more public speaking. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm yeah. so glad to have you here. Yeah. Real boon. Sweet. Um, for those of you who are here, John sent me a several page digest of questions and we will not get to all of them. Your questions are amazing and I want to thank you also for sending them. Uh, I don't know the names on them and John really pre-digested them for me. <laughs> Still though, it helps me to sense the field, to really read and, and ponder your questions and try to empathize from like with where you're coming from. So thank you so much for sending those just so I can feel some connection with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you. Sweet. So let's get started. Uh, yes. What brought you to the mat in, when you first started in those first few years and what brings you now and are they the same? They're not the same. This is a great question, thank you. Um, you actually got me thinking back to the very first year of my practice in 2000. And the short version is what brought me to the mat then was my body begging me to come back, <laughs> like begging me to slow down. And that is definitely not what brings me to the mat now. Now I would say for better or for worse, I have this fire in my mind that is a, uh, I want to understand consciousness. And it is that, you know, I practice to keep the instrument sharp, get up and do it before I teach. Like that's just taken for granted. That's part of the surrender. But the fire is this curiosity. What is mm. consciousness? Um, I have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have an unanswerable question to, to keep me moving. Um, but I thought maybe I'd rewind and, and give you a little bit of story around that first part, because I've never shared this bit. And this it goes to that interest that you have in talking about dharma. Is that um, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in 2000, actually I'll rewind to 99. So I grew up in Montana, got out there, out of there as fast as I could, uh, got some scholarships to study uh, from a really humble and simple background. And uh, I had a real desire to have a life of adventure in the world. Um, I worked as a journalist. I had a degree in journalism. I had a job at Gannett. Uh, then I got a Fulbright and went and interviewed journalists all over Central America, learning about the sort of way that leftist journalism was able to destabilize proto-fascist states. Mm -hmm. so early in my 20s, I just wanted to be in the world uh, doing super altruistic adventures. Um, and I moved to Seattle when I was 22 to work at a place called the Independent Media Center that had helped to shut down the WTO uh, the year before. 
Yeah. You were in the riots? <laughs> um, no, I was in Nicaragua during the riots, but I was all about the that movement for social justice and human rights activism. Sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it was the international life of activism industry. That was my deal. Um, and the part of my plan when I'd been uh, vagabonding around was to set myself up for a life of, of international journalism. And so I was trying to train my digestion to eat and drink anything. Mm. So I refused to drink purified water. This is like the opposite of Ayurvedic wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> um, I ate every, uh, every bit of fresh fruit that was sitting out in markets, right? I started to get really sick there in 1999 and 2000. By the time I landed in, in Seattle, I had insisted case of Giardia. I had a tapeworm. I had no digestive fire at all and all kinds of back pain, sciatica, all kinds of trouble. I got a real job in the midst of the activism at the IMC to, at the Seattle University not-for-profit MBA program, which was amazing. I got a kind of informal education in not-for-profit leadership that year. And my mentors were like, 22 years old, why are you so sick? <laughs> like, take care of yourself, go to yoga. And that was the move. Oh. Yes, that was the move. Um, before the almost dying in a car accident, it was that my digestion was broken. Yeah. And it's so, like, now I understand that this is the healing purpose of the primary series. Yeah. And I see it in so many iterations just parallel to mine that this is a program that really, really heals your gut and brings the digestive fire forth to take care of you. And I just tripped into it. So I started doing a drop-in Ashtanga based class Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then thank you, Richard, for the um, VHS, a version of the primary series, <laughs> uh, which I would do at home on other days. And it healed my digestion. And yeah, I still, right. very much so, it, I'd become very stagnant and I could eat white bread and rice. I ate white foods for two years. and. Um, the, I, this morning I was having this beautiful memory of being in the, the co-op grocery in Seattle and looking at almonds and actually connecting with my hunger and my desire to, to fuel myself. And it was really from the practice, being able to come into my body instead of that obsessive like outward movement and just feel mm. and taste and nurture myself. That was from the practice. Um, still took me a while to slow down. I still did, you know, have to like get hit by a car and paralyzed for a night. Um, but that was the beginning of it. I'm really, really grateful. So what, what brings you on the mat now? Is are they this? I mean, I assume your digestion's a little bit better. You don't have. To it's it's there. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really. You know, I've been sitting, doing serious sitting practice for almost as long as I've been in the yoga. And for a while, I thought I understood mind. And I'm kind of on the other side of thinking I understand. Yeah. I love to practice. Even more than asana, I love to sit. And I'm not motivated so much by wanting to heal my suffering. I know that would be a noble motivation, but I really am motivated by a curiosity and a desire to understand. I think there's a big part of my life story is the search for understanding. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever get there, but that's, that's what it is for me. And I respond very well to a discipline life. So a regular schedule last 20 years has done very well for me. Yeah. So you weren't like a, a, a fighter I find that there's a lot of people that yeah. kind of fight authority that are attracted to the practice, yeah. which is ironic. Like for me, I, I can say I felt I had that for a long time. And then because yeah. I recognize, as soon as I recognized that mirror in myself, that I was like, oh, wait, I've got this. This is me. I'm, I'm the one. <laughs> myself. Well, you know, I also am a preacher's kid, which you uh, you were kind enough to leave out. Um, yeah. 
And my, you know, in my astrological chart, the relationship with the father is really central. Mm. And my dad and I are really, really close. And he's a, he's a hospital chaplain. He's 73 years old. He's on the front lines right now. Yeah. And uh, we went through my adolescence and his spiritual adolescence. The 1990s sucked for us both. Uh, but I think we both worked a lot on ourselves. And so definitely there was, there was that kind of rising up phase and, and his like meeting me there. Uh, but we've been on the other side of that for a really long time. Um, so definitely I'm glad that I got a chance to experience that in this lifetime. Um, he gave me his blessing in my work about six years ago. And he, you know, he's a, he's a self-identified <laughs> Christian fundamentalist. So that's pretty crazy to, to think that a yoga teacher daughter is like, that's okay. Like, you know, they, they uh, were not comfortable with it for the first 15 years. And after that, I just kind of like set down a whole lot of my fight, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. oh, now what? Yeah. 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 Uh, let's talking about these times, I know that you and yeah. I have a practice that we kind of keep, which is structured and, you know, regular, but a lot of yes. other people are having some hard times in this practice where they can't get to the studio. So do you have any words of advice that you can give to some folks that are dealing with COVID yes. and um, the isolation, I think is the biggest part. Uh, yeah. Um, the first thing is make sure you've got like, you know, in your background, the, the Buddhist tradition, there's the triple gem, right? Like mm -hmm. how does that translate into the, the Ashtanga world? I always think teacher practice community. Like if you're lost, check in and make sure you have those three legs of your stool, mm -hmm. like set. So some spiritual friends, right? Some community right. that's actually, of value to you that's not toxic to you um a method like a method that's stable that means that you don't always have to rely on your preferences or or the push and pull of like and dislike to figure out how you're supposed to put together your sadhana and some sort of sense of like a accountability person or someone who's there in a in a teaching capacity to also help you through. If you're trying to do it without one of those, it's gonna suck. Um, and you deserve, uh, you deserve a full foundation behind you. Um, you're not responsible for like, you know, like, <laughs> like pickaxing your way through to the mountaintop. Um, and for me, I, I don't have children. And so this is a big one that I'm not really capable of, of advising on. But I, I just asked Shara directly two weeks ago, and he had something that was really valuable that I've shared with my students on that point, which is, you know, not seeing your path as separate from your time with your kids now. Because if you do, they'll, they'll respond to that by giving you more attention. Um, and so he, you know, he, he's like, yes, try to get up earlier than them. Uh, but, <laughs> but if that's not happening, um, the increased sense of, sense of separation from the kids sometimes can make it harder right now. Mm -hmm. And my, my students who are actually amazing spiritual warriors, so is it the same, you know, if they're going to wander in and help you with your, with your forward bend, it's kind of like got to let it happen. Yeah. Um, I personally, do really well with the schedule. And not everybody does. For some people that creates a kind of OCD thing or more push and pull. If I can surrender to a schedule, I do extremely well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I find it's nice to also know how much time you have and how much time you can get in something. Like just knowing like, okay, well standing I can do and say, mm -hmm. you know, 30 minutes like okay oh, yeah whatever it is you know however long it takes you to do that knowing exactly how long yeah totally um, something it's good trick <clears throat> this is something my students have really clarified for me too that like having a tight container and then giving yourself just a little less than what you think you need 
So you yeah. don't have any extra time, like pick at your toenails or like check your text <laughs> messages. <laughs> you know, um, we have a thing on our website that's curated for my students, their best practices for, for getting it done. Um, I can send you that link later. No. Uh, and later I want to talk about lead class because I think my students who have done a ton of lead have this kind of installation of this other pattern that's mm. different from whatever vritti might show up on the map that if you kind of like just just lull yourself into that altered state yeah. that's the pattern yeah. sometimes it'll do it for you yeah right <laughs> yeah. and i also uh, want to talk about injury yeah. but i wanted to just say the other thing yeah. i'll mention is when i had a um really traumatic accident my my motivation was always like, yeah, I know that yoga is supposed to feel good. But when, when I was undergoing that situation, it was a point of, oh, this has to, I have to reorient why I'm doing this, which is to feel good. And, mm. and I think for me in these times, like you, you, at least if you're like, if your mind is a little stubborn to believing it early in the morning, <laughs> After 15, 20 years you can just let that mantra wait this is supposed to feel good you know like how mm -hmm. can we make this feel good and mm -hmm. it's so silly but we'll no, talk about not it. at all there is like training the, the deep mind beneath the the cognitive mind mm -hmm. um we do a thing at the shala here we have this mantra like notice the effects notice the effects of what you're doing so that you can catch yourself if you're moving out of balance, right? But also at the end of practice, you go and you say the benediction at the end of practice, like notice the effects of the practice. Cause that will, I have just never regretted doing it so far. I have never like finished the practice. And, oh, that was just a waste of my energy. You know, <laughs> so that builds like a, a kind of faith that's a faith beneath the cognitive mind also. Kind of keeps the positive samskara building. Okay, um, so those are a, a few things about COVID and the practice. Um, yeah. how, how do you think people might find it? How, how can they, f like, this is, I think, a hard thing for beginners in this situation, whereas yeah. you and I are very facilitating to regular practice. Yeah. How, how, you know, in these times, as long as we're online, what are some ways that someone might come into the yeah. uh, communication with a teacher that they want to build a relationship with? Yeah. Um, so, like, synchronicity happens when you're looking for it, right? If you, there's, this is not a, like a magical thing in the universe. It's like when the mind is open for, magic sometimes things happen right yeah. um, and that's not magic that's just the openness in the mind yeah. um so the last month you know our whole shala moved into a 2d space and i've always been really deliberate about working in relationship and so that gives us a format to continue relationship um but a couple of new people have come into my life through weird super weird magical synchronicities. I wish I could tell those stories, but they're their stories, not mine. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there is this possibility of, of weird circumstances that'll kind of show you a path. And there's a lot of the whole world, like the entire structure of the world just fell down. Capitalism just imploded, you know, at least for a while. And so the the shape of our world, like we're in a power vacuum and we're in a structural vacuum right now. And sometimes you speak into the vacuum and you can kind of create new possibilities. And I'm really seeing a lot of that with people arriving to the practice through not acts of will, but just acts of openness. So I've kind of increased my capacity too, because I'm not, I'm not touching a hundred bodies every morning now. And so it means that I have a little extra capacity to build new relationships in 2D that I might not have if I were touching everybody. You know, our work is just so hard because of the energetic outlay working with bodies. Yeah. Um, so right now we both, we both have different capacities um, because we're working in this much more stripped down manner. I mean, it's not yeah. everything. There are many I feel like I can conserve my 
Prana a little bit better in oh, these two. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and we have to be careful with the screens, but we do have a certain capacity to, to do the 2D. Um, so, I mean, I know that's not good advice, like look for the magic, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if somebody's gotten this far, they're probably, they're probably uh, switched on a little bit, you know, and probably finding a pathway through somehow. Um, there's a lot of mastery out there. There really is. Um, yeah, and it's it, the people who are like a little harder to find usually. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. You're very good. You have a, like a social sociology background. I do. Yeah. You're welcoming so many people. I've seen you assist in the main shala and I have to just be honest. I thought that you did a much better job than I have ever done all the times I've assisted. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was like, Angela. I was like, I also <laughs> felt the same. I was like, Hey, <laughs> um, but uh, so what I, what I want to know from you is how um, do we incorporate uh, body positive and inclusivity um, and diversity into our classes? How do we facilitate that in such a way that like really takes action? Right. I, well, I, fir I first think that we have to like kind of screen for some of the the motives that could bring us to the mat that would be like compulsive or controlling you know our our approach to practice like we're disciplined but we're not controlled you know <laughs> god neither is our teacher right there's a sense of like radical acceptance like awkwardness like yeah. here, here's what here's one i response to that it's like relish the awkwardness of having a body, right? Like we're supposed experts in advanced asana. Like I'm the most awkward. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> right? um, so for my own part, I think I have a responsibility not to present myself as some sort of like paragon of anything. I mean, you and I had this funny thing where elephant journal somehow like got a picture of me in uh, some advanced posture and like put it on their website. I was like, I don't, I don't want to like, I'm a thin white woman who does advanced series. The world doesn't need that vision of me. I don't think it's helpful. Um, like that's not who I'm connecting with is people who want to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm connecting with people who want to love the present moment. Like it, it's an accident that, that I show up in a normative body. And I'm not going to like continue to feed the machine. I think a lot of this is like embedded in the, in the capitalist machine that sells yoga with a certain form, a certain form of female body. And we're in this incredible reckoning right now. I think a lot of the questions that we got reflect this amazing sort of we're inside looking at what we've created. You know, there's that meme. Um, Mother Nature has sent you inside to think about what you've done, um, which is like a very punitive thing. And I don't buy that punitiveness at all, but we are inside looking at ourselves and yeah. reckoning with what the practice is right now. And I think that's a lot of the questions that we're getting are people from a, from a sort of evaluative standpoint, like what have we created? Um, but in any case, the, the approach to the practice that's, about loving the present moment includes the body, mm -hmm. includes just the, the surrender of some of that like controlling and also really damaging capitalist conditioning so that you know, we can actually critique it. You know, yoga is like a radical critique of capitalist values, if we're paying attention. Yeah. You know, and capitalist values are control of the body and like sculpting yourself into some sort of statuesque form, like to sell. And so other people can have uh, a kind of mimetic desire for what you have. Like the less we participate in that, the better. And this is a time when I think we are getting a break from a lot of that capitalist messaging. Um, and if it bothers you and you're still consuming it, that's probably part of your own media diet that needs to be addressed. 
right? Because like a lot of a lot of the the messaging that is disturbing is there because people are consuming it. So just stop consuming it if it bothers you. Well, I think done, right. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because uh, even John Campbell said when he first yeah. came to the practice that he wanted he was interested in the sight of it. You know, that was what got him. And yeah. for me, that wasn't really the case. I don't know if that was the case for you. I wasn't I so interested in the form as I was yeah. all the like the breathing techniques and the and how I could steady my mind, which sounds like really cliche, but it really no, was. Oh, that's me too. Because I was like really messed up. Yeah. So, but that you can't show. True. Uh, it's mm. interesting this time we have, and I can say from my teaching's perspective, when I'm watching my score, that's all I get to see. I don't get to hear all the breath or all of the, I don't have this uh, darshan, the sharing that's going on with the site. Yeah. Like they can't quite see me and I can only see them in 2D. So it's, for me, I find it difficult in these times because I'm really trying to get beyond this um, limited, limited platform. Me too. And, so I want to share, I want, to, you know, that yes. incorporated, you know, sharing to go on, but. It is, it's really hard in the, in the ways that this kind of collapses this dimensionality into form. One way that, that I think is helping us is like, well, what is lead class? You know, we're doing a lot of lead. Um, there's like a, a group harmony that comes in lead, like the synchrony of the student body. We've got people in 12 time zones. It's so crazy. I'm like, you're doing like class at 8 p.m. I don't get it. But like you want to synchronize <laughs> with this particular student body. Fine. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, yeah. the, but there's like this sense of like, that seems to take some of the, the obsession with what it looks like a little bit down because so much of lead is like working with timing. And we're in this hilarious experience of time and space right now that that opens up opportunities for 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 like really funny stuff. And that's something that I've learned from Shut Up. Is like I learned to do lead by sitting on the stairs day after day after day and just listening to him do lead. It's never quite the same. This is not a like controlled form. There's no perfect lead class. Everyone has no way. No way. This is, you're not yoga robots. Forget that OCD nonsense, right? Lead class is theater. It's like an experience of like being in shared time. And like so much of the, the brilliance of it is his sense of timing is insanely good. Mm -hmm. And so just the, the little vrittis he'll introduce to, to get your attention. Like five. You know? <laughs> um, and somehow we're introducing some of that, us in 12 time zones, doing lead, you know, the cat comes in and like knocks the computer down. Some of those rifties actually connect us in time space in a way that is intimate, that gets us beyond that world of form. Yeah, and that gets to the question that I, you know that you had brought up and that I yeah. mentioned earlier about the differences in the lead class in Mysore yeah. and how um, is one of them a little bit better than another? Yeah. Um, what are some of the differences that you see? For me, I can say mm -hmm. that it brings, mm -hmm. for me, the lead class is a letting go. And, and for me, I have a hard time with that sometimes. And so um, there's cultivating letting go where I rest, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where I'm actively letting go. And so to try to become, yeah, this kind of monster of just surrender of just like follow the count, you know, so to speak, totally. yeah. really challenge for me. And I see that and, and it also helps me yeah. um, do a little bit of that with that surrendering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what are there your thoughts on I've never thought about it this way, but there is a yin and yang there between the, mm -hmm. the kind of lead and the, yeah. and the Mysore that's on your time. Yeah, very yang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. The, I think it's fair to say that for you and me, our, our first love is the Mysore room. Yeah. 
right? Uh, there's just no place I'd rather be. It's weird going without it right now. And I'm under no illusions that it can be replaced in any way. Um, but the lead is its own really interesting form that, like I said, that installation of a rhythm in the deep mind can be an amazing resource for us. But also right now, I'm really seeing how much it harmonizes the student body. You know, across tremendous dimensionality of time and space still harmonizes a student body. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's that bit about teacher practice community. You know, you're not necessarily alone. Um, I have taken shout out slide classes. And for me, that like evocation of the rhythm, because I've done just a ton of his lead, actually renews that resource. It's a real replenishing. Mm -hmm. um, so it also has the, the kind of teacher connection, even if it is two dimensional, it like it's in my brain in like four dimensions. So it, uh, it just kind of is an evocation. I feel like it cleans up a lot too oh, oh and, and reframes, God. um, like the framing, you know, yes. when we're doing my sores like there, but when we, when we're in a, especially in the new building, for example, there's like, you know, this huge super organism of just breathing, like, at least in the sun salutations, everyone's just in sync. And it's like, wow, you can really get lost in that. And it's beautiful. Completely. Right. Yeah, you're just one drop in this ocean, right? Yeah. Um, here's, so, you know, a lot of Ashtanga, we also have to watch the pizza, right? Um, I have a little, my fire is a little bit low. Um, and so like, if anything, I'm always needing to keep the fire lit and burning. Um, but I've been doing a lot of Tretika, which is one of, yeah, a every day I do Tretika now. Oh, cool. um, and that's, you know, that's a meditation technique, but it's also a purification. It's one yeah. of the original six purifications. You actually tear. It does in <laughs> fact, <laughs> yeah, that's if I need true. to have a cry, it will get done. <laughs> You can um, the bars or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we do often, unless somebody is struggling with a like too much pizza in their system, um, in that case, they'll look like in a bowl of water. But we do five minutes of tretica before every lead. Oh. Yeah. And we just, we did it, ran it as an experiment one day, and everybody was like so synchronized after that. Mm -hmm. I think it, there's like a, we're like throwing it in the fire. You know, there's some, and there is like a lot of fire element in the, in the screen. So as long as we're not becoming imbalanced with too much fire, I do think that is a way of evoking like the ancient roots of meditation, just looking in the fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's one kind of the, one kind of offering, right? Yeah. My, my mother likes to call this thing and that I do that I've devoted my life to stretching. And she said, <laughs> Spiritual stretching. Right. And, and I, it was like, okay, well, she's really actually onto something because I think we're making offerings of body, speech, and mind. And so we're doing asana, um, we're, we're stretching our breath, and then yes. we're stretching our drishti or this idea of a fixed self. And so, so good. Hey, I think Trataka is really, and also the drishti is themselves. Some are like fixed, and then some are infinite. We're trying to lengthen, you know, get rid of this idea of a fixed self. Yes, drishti. those infinite drishtis are, those are some deep <laughs> <Hard> spiritual <laughs> teaching, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. that's what uh, Richard said is like, and then you find it silly because it's already in you. <laughs> You're already <laughs> touching the infinite the whole time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, do you, let's keep going. Um, so, one question that we had was on injury. Uh, mm. Do you want to address any insights that you've had? Uh, have you found um, what if the injury is chronic? So, what if you know, like, I never, I'm never going to heal. How do I stay? Um, focused on a practice where I feel like I'm not getting any benefits or that this thing is constantly going to be with me and how do you learn to go deeper into these non-physical aspects when you have this 
like I, I can say from myself when I had real trauma, that kind of pain was, whew, it was not just, oh, my shoulder's hurting. You know, it was serious. That's all I can think about. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do we, or, and you just had surgery on your knee and I know I like did. that probably brought up a lot. So oh, um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear you talk about that a little uh, bit. How to stay um, here. Yeah, this is, first, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I'm, I'm 43 years old, 20 years into the path. There's still a lot that I don't understand. And the way that I am constantly reminded of that is because I'm so close with my father he shares a lot with me about his his work so he's a his main job is like he's the guy you call when there's nobody else to call mm -hmm. and he'll hold your hand when you die and that just clarifies to me like how like how his heart has just exploded doing this work mm -hmm. and he's also set down like all the preacherly dogma being the guy who knows he's so over it mm -hmm. like he's on the other side of so much of the, the being the man. He's just there to be present with people. And so I think his ability to, to equanimize tremendous pain and suffering, I can only try to imitate that now because I haven't, I haven't really internalized or integrated that level of like spiritual understanding. Yeah. Um, but that said, from a technical standpoint, um, like, I mean, yoga is training for a good death. It is that, right? And what my dad said is all the time, you know, there are people who they, they die really badly because they're in a state of conge congealed sort of clinging to life as well as being like in the compounding of emotional pain and spiritual pain and physical pain and mental pain. Yeah. And there are people who just kind of disintegrate and break up. And a lot of what we're training to do is, is the letting go of like kind of the, the disintegration without the, the kind of clinging on to our pain. It's so, we talk a lot this, about this back at, when we're in 3D at the Shala is recognizing that one of the really interesting things that comes up when we're in pain is the narrative that the pain is never going to go away hmm. right it's so weird we like cling on to the worst of experience hmm. and i mean we're wired for that we're wired for the negativity bias it's so deeply natural right. and normal <clears throat> but the one of the mechanisms of discernment in the yoga path is learning to decompose experience into its component parts and i don't know if your students know the pancha kosha model but Oh, we work with that all the time. So like, this is the theory of the human that we are made up of five layers, kind of like babushkas, right? And so the physical layer is one fifth of who you are in this theory. It's a, it's a nice, it's a nice metaphysics. It doesn't work for everybody. Some of my students are like, oh my God, Angela, like, because <laughs> um, they're like hardcore scientists or whatever. Um, but well, if you can- you if get you... to that another Maya Kosha, that's the one that really throws everybody in. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like really, like there's an inner body of bliss, give me a break, Angela. I'm like, okay, at, oh, least, you, at, least, at least work with me for the other four, right? Um, but the, that mechanism of discernment, and yoga is the development of Viveka, right? Being able to distinguish the mental suffering from the physical suffering, from the, the deep mind, the deep psychic suffering, and decompose those layers. What I have found is that, okay, so if you're going to you, there's this cliche about injuries or teachers. And if you take that as like, you and I have our Christian conditioning that can be a bit, um, can glorify suffering a little bit, that's not helpful. And so like noticing that samskara, it's like, oh, your suffering will purify you. Like, like setting that down. But also recognizing that if you're in pain, that actually can teach you because it'll show you the difference between the narrative around the pain and the, the deep psychic suffering around the pain and then the raw physical pain, mm -hmm. right? So it can help you decompose the layers so that it, you know, inevitably we will die you know inevitably 
at some point, like life will happen to us. And this is practice for life to happen. I'm sorry, but like, at some point, like yoga will include pain. <laughs> um, and like, if it doesn't, you're just in spiritual bypass land. Um, and so like that sense is like how we approach injury as a teacher. It's like, can it help me to decompose and get insight into the, the different layers of my being? And so they're not all entangled and I'm not in this state of intense sort of overwhelm of pain and suffering. It's, you know, in the, in the Buddhist tradition, there's like the second era. Um, and, you know, the first arrow is the raw pain and the second arrow is your reaction to the pain. Um, and the second one's usually much worse. So, <laughs> um, it's in that, <laughs> not glorifying pain, but rather using it as insight that, that we try to approach injury as a teacher. Do you think, this just came to thought, so yeah. you feel free not to answer it, but do you sure. think reincarnation helps in that letting go, like of any Vesha? Like, I, I find that for some people who are so fixed with this, you know, this is beginning, this is end, that can be like a framing or grasping. And yeah. um, even just entertaining the idea that, you know, that things go on, actually, you know, and it's more provable that it can't go to nothing then <laughs> when it, it could, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there, cause no one can discover nothing. Right. So, right. <laughs> so great discovery. my, my students keep me really accountable uh, to my metaphysics. So it, because so many of them are scholars and so many of them are, you know, hardcore scientists, yeah. it's actually science. Um, and so, I never ask them to entertain wild metaphysical notions, but, but we could like in my own imagination, I do feel like I had an incarnation and I'm in it and it has a certain purpose and it has certain lessons that I'm here to learn. And even in this bounded sense of like, you know, the hundred years I have here, there is that sense of like, even if I don't bring in the idea of the Anandamaya Kosha or my soul, there's still that sense of spiritual purpose in being here. And in that bounded sense of a life, I have reincarnated so many times. All of us do, like we are born and die and the self comes into and goes out of existence. We have been so many people, <laughs> right? And even in that sense of like finding a through line of all the people that we've been, of like the, the life learning that we're doing. Um, I think entertaining that notion is a kind of non-metaphysical way to really get benefit from that idea of reincarnation. Like we die every time we go to sleep. The body goes out of existence. That's not normal. And then we reincarnate when the mind comes back in the body in the waking up. Yeah. That's not normal. Like we should problematize that and see how weird it is to become a self again every morning uh, and a uh, one that thinks it is the same self is the <laughs> right yeah like the like, illusion you know, same <laughs> yes you know. uh okay i'd like to talk a little bit about um just really quickly if you're willing to uh about and this might be dangerous but uh the lack i'm of, all about danger <laughs> the, the lack of like teacher trainings mm. or intensives uh, has a lack of offering intensives, you know, from, from an Ashtanga teaching lineage perspective, whatever that means. Um, mm. You know, you and I are supposed to not do teacher trainings or intensives. And right. there's, there's some degree I felt that is limited both in terms of me learning to offer these things, but also for students that might be willing to get more focused, a structure to cultivate and develop this. So do you, do you feel like, you don't have to answer it if you don't want oh, to. Oh, I, I <laughs> no problem. <laughs> at certain time. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll use my sociology training mm -hmm. as a, as a sense of framework. So, the, the sociology toolbox is amazing for 
addressing structural inequality, which is something I'm always thinking about in my work. Um, the, this big, open, and certainly not closed question about the way that we relate to the body and norms around the body, everything about the, the race, class, gender, uh, religious uh, inequalities and forms of discrimination that show on foot in practice. But the sociology is also really good for understanding the nature of work. And my training is in cultural and economic sociology. And the model that has really helped me, and more and more as I go deeper, you know, still so much I don't understand about the yoga tradition, but as I go deeper into that, the, the model of apprenticeship that comes to us out of the kind of like journeyman, like sort of European work tradition also has really interesting synchrony with some of the, the oral tradition in, in the, the sort of yoga tradition. Um, mm. Our group is reading The Spell of the Sensuous right now by David Abram. We're doing a lot of rereading. I've read it before. Um, we're in this like real redigestion phase. And in The Spell of the Sensuous, there's several chapters on the, the oral tradition and on transmission in oral cultures and how embodied that is. Um, and that's a big part of why I have gotten so much mileage out of bringing the, the more sort of European, like journeyman, like apprenticeship tradition into my own work. Um, so I do think that apart from like the, the yoga teacher training model, which is, you know, oh, like anybody can be a yoga teacher and you can learn to do it in 200 hours. I understand why that is like, <laughs> like, this is watering down. Like, like there's already so much wrong knowledge out there. Like that's a really surefire way to like increase the amount of wrong knowledge. Um, but the apprenticeship model and it's how Dominic taught me whether he like mm -hmm. never like decided that was what he was doing or not. He took me yeah. into apprenticeship is uh it's kind of a living accountability structure because you know i i get stuck a lot and i can call this person and he's there sort of as a mentor when i screw up and so i do think there is like we we had some questions about accountability and this like comes into the the apprenticeship model where it's like okay well there's if there's a chain of relationship where we also know going not only going backwards but going forwards if we give an instruction we're responsible for that instruction then there there can be kind of a a human line of transmission in it like it like that preserves the the morality of the culture <laughs> Pardon? that preserves the telephone game totally told <laughs> that's exactly what i'm thinking actually is like keeps it alive in a way that's that's not based on learning yoga from books, where at least there's like some feedback in the telephone game, right? Yeah. Um, but I do think that one of the, so like I've defined my work as I'm creating some sort of, things have changed now, but up until like three months ago, um, creating a space for dedicated practice in Ann Arbor, but also mentoring teachers who can take the practice beyond me. And not in a teacher training sense, like nobody who I mentor is allowed to pay anything for that. Like they are paying that forward. Uh, but definitely at our level, our teachers have invested so much in us. Like that's not supposed to just sit. Like we're actually supposed to be passing it on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so actually finding people who we know can go further than us and investing in them. That's, I mean, there's this bigger structural problem, but that's my very local answer to this kind of the situation where there is a dearth of mastery in the yoga field. So at least find people who I know are better than me. <laughs> and I try, try to do my best to, to be behind them. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, last one. So we talked yesterday, I guess we were on and we mentioned about the um, differences of teaching in Mysore city, like India versus when you come home, you know, like there you're generally speaking, most people there are fairly healthy. They're fairly of a different economic echelon. Mm -hmm. They, you know, come from, it's just a different 
teaching scenario. And they, mindset. Yeah. They don't have to go to work in the morning. We don't have to, as teachers, don't have to go to work in the, you know, when we're there. So it's, totally. and then when I get back, you know, I'm required to do this Herculean practice and then launch into like, you know, the whole thing. So <laughs> I want to know what your thoughts are about um, how to teach, how to cater to people yeah. outside of the castle walls, you know, outside of Buddhist castle walls, um, in terms um, of the students, different motivations and their abilities. For sure. For sure. I mean, going to, in to the castle walls, for me, it feels like more of this activity of keeping the instrument sharp. Um, and also teaching my story is just so hard. <laughs> Uh, and there, burnout's very real. So we do need a little time to just, you know, restore the fire sometimes. Um, but at home, I have a, a safety mechanism that, that I look for and that wasn't present. You know, I spent almost 10 years practicing in Los Angeles, which is a super materialistic culture and super, uh, you know, gymnastic in its, its sort of interpretation of what asana is. Um, and I had amazing mentors and teachers there, and so I was a little insulated from that, but it's still in the, the wider world that I was participating in. It's not so much in our enclaves, right? No. Um, but making sure that students understand that the practice is there to support the life. And if the practice is the main event, that's an issue, right? Whereas in my story, the practice is the main event. Mm -hmm. right? And for me, for a long time, practice was the main event. Um, in fact, that's how I like got diverted off the scholarly path. You know, it's like, oh, actually, I, I, like I had so much attachment to the practice for many years that, that it kind of had its own gravitational pull. Yeah. away from all the other parts of just living my life. Um, so in, the practice is a sadhana. It's supposed to be the thing that you do to, to bring yourself into alignment, mind, body, spirit, psyche, emotions, before you go out and do your day so that your day can be your spiritual practice, right? It's not like the sadhana isn't the end in itself. It's just, it's this thing that makes you more resilient and primes you to spiritualize, to monasticize your life. And so in that way, like really working carefully with students so that they have a practice that they could do really consistently that will support the life and it doesn't become overwhelming um, seems to be a way to sort of monasticize it and to, to use life instead of life being a distraction, to use life as the field of practice. Um, and once, you know, again, like without children, there's so much that I don't understand about the householder's life, but that's what this practice was designed to do, is to mm. be one for householders. And so I place a lot of attention on, on really supporting householders and being there for people in the, like, who are creating a family and understanding as much as I can around that. And also being honest that, like, that hasn't been my path. Um, the, I do think also it's good to have a minimum requirement. I just won't teach somebody if they don't practice three days a week. It's just like, it's not worth their energy. It's certainly not worth my energy to try to invest in like, a, like a basic transmission of a sadhana if it's really, really, really uneven and irregular. Um, so there does have to be like some baseline level of commitment, but it can still be 20 minutes, three days a week. That's fine. Yeah. But it actually has to have that element of consistency if it's going to start to like give you information about the life and integrate into the life. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, it also helps me know who I'm not supposed to invest in because if they can't like show up at that level, you know, you get, like I had a, a yeah. javelin thrower a few years back, you know, and, and of course he's like, kind of like really asymmetrical. So 
it's only left side posture. It's just like tell him I was like, well, you know, if you want to be a professional javelin player, then probably I don't recommend you know trying to iron out all of these asymmetries. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to, you know, considering, you know, to maybe change some of that, then right. you know, it's a nice tool to do that. Mm -hmm. It definitely, it's interesting because that first half of primary series is really bringing us into consciousness of our imbalances and mm -hmm. drives us nuts sometimes because we realize all the default imbalances because we're actually not yoga robots. You're not supposed to be. And, and like, it's there. The design is so brilliant to, to kind of create a, Holla holla. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like it's right there for you. All the holla holla you can possibly. <laughs> um, but I also, uh, you know, I I used to say that that I I teach your eight year old self, and that's this idea of like personally, I I love yoga so much, and and I'm on the the life program, um, and I want to take care of my body in such a way that I'll be able to practice it, it in my old age. And then I had students who were like 80, like, Angela, knock it off. Like, you're teaching my 100-year-old body. <laughs> like, like, I got in trouble with them. <laughs> and, and so that has also been a huge teacher to, mm -hmm. to think about sustainability for a 100-year-old body, which is what, you know, our students who are millennials and younger are really gonna uh, need, you know, the, the life expectancy in, yeah. you know, the healthcare system expectancy. Like this is a big part of their sustainability in their health. And yeah. so adapting the practice to, to 80 year old bodies um, has really kind of helped me think about like, what are the, what are its actual fundamentals? Yeah. Well, breath, bunda, drishti. There's a lot you can do with breath, bunda, drishti, even if your body isn't gonna ever do sun salutations. Yeah. You know, Krishna Macharya didn't like, he wasn't a huge fan of sun salutations. Not everybody starts there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there's certain, obviously certain places where as a teacher we go where we don't rem have the experience or we don't remember that experience. You know, like I, I can never talk about pregnancy in the way that right. someone <laughs> who experienced that or even talking to an 80 year old is a little difficult sometimes, but I think mm -hmm. those foundational elements that you alluded to, you know, the breath, bundle, and drishti are really important to always come back to and to just remember that the point, I guess, is that you're trying to develop compassion for yourself and others on and off the mat, as you said. Yeah. There's something that's coming up for me. Um, do I have, can I have a minute? Yeah, you can have as many minutes as you want. Um, you know, you and I started this conversation uh a month ago and you said you know angela can you talk about hope in the practice i was like i don't know i don't know how to talk about that but in this conversation i've actually something that is super hopeful is coming up to me and that is the the people who are coming to the practice now there are a lot i'm guessing in this audience as well there are a lot of people in their late teens and early 20s in my life who want a sudna Mm -hmm. You know, we started talking about like Angela at age 22. I was not that evolved. I was like running away from my body at 100 miles an hour. Right? And now there are people coming into my life who are spiritually and emotionally and mentally ready for a sadhana pretty early in life and also have that like externally oriented altruism of like, oh, wow, the world is messed up and I want to contribute. Um, and that was, you know, that isn't just, that feels kind of new, the, that youthful spiritual maturity. Yeah. And I feel a lot of hope about nurturing that and supporting that going forward. Not only so, you know, these younger students can have all the spiritual tools they need to address suffering, but also so they're like, have the power to move out into the world and, and to their dharma. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, th thank you so much. I think we're going to open the discussion for the chat room now. Sure. So, if, Anna, you want to go ahead and uh, open that up. And if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Angela, um, now would be a great time. Um, 
So feel free. And you're also welcome to, if you'd like to be seen, you can turn your camera on, but try to keep yourself muted. If you don't mind, that'll help us maintain better audio quality. Okay. All quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> One question. Yes. Angela, what was your knee issue? Was it a replacement? Name issue? Knee. 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 Oh, oh, no. It was anterior meniscus. A meniscus, okay. Yes, and I, uh, it was something that came up about four years ago when I was demonstrating John Usher Shasana C in teaching, and I jumped onto the floor and real quick put myself in a John C, uh, which was just a really dumb move on my part. Uh, and then um, I actually had a moment with my father who is immortal, by the way, but somehow his mortality came up and he fell and I caught him. And uh, so this is the right side, you know, like I have all my uh, <laughs> injuries on the right side associated with the masculine side. And in that moment when I caught my father when he fell, I collapsed in my right knee. I'd already had that, that predisposition from the John um, And then I also think that over the course of, I didn't start learning uh, fourth series until I was in my 40s. And I do think that some of those really, really deep joint rotations in the four series had an impact on the meniscus as well. Um, so I kind of made the decision um, together with the surgeon for the football team at the University of Michigan to address the very subtle uh, sort of uh, fraying of the front of the meniscus. Um, he said, you know, most people have that level of fraying in your knee and you have basically 25 year old knees, but if you really are sensitive to it, you can have it scoped. And, uh, so we made that decision to do that. And I'm very grateful to have had that level of care. And I also think that it alerted me to, you know, some of my baseline stuff, like the tendency to overuse my body in teaching, um, the the desire to like carry people and also my decisions about how I practice. I um yeah, I'm kind of getting to the place where I've lost interest in fourth series. Uh sorry, John. <laughs> but but now, you know, as uh when I think about practicing to keep the instrument sharp, I'm thinking about reinterpreting it for the long run. That my surgery experience was amazing. I stayed conscious for it and they let me watch. And it was this incredible experience of feeling cared for by a team of 14 absolute experts while I watched the inside of my knee be opened up and, and scoped out. Um, yep. That was an overwhelmingly positive, wonderful experience. Well, thank you. Angela, someone asked, uh, who were some of your female role models when you were first starting your practice? Oh. Um, so I started at Yoga Works, which was uh, directed by Chuck and Mati. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't have a strong relationship with your Chuck and Mati because what was happening there was like this situation where there are tons of teachers. There, I think they had like six Mysore programs within the sort of Yoga Works world. And I was there when they sold Yoga Works to the 24 hour fitness people. But I actually think that even though so much of my work has been constructing a, a yoga that's not capitalist, you know, my work is like, I run a co-op and people pay what they can. At this point, all my work is donation basis. And so that pure experience of yoga capitalism gave me a lot of, like, I actually did, John, I did have some real pushback around it. But I wrote to Mati, wow, like, 14 months ago, I said, you know, you probably don't remember me, but you had this huge impact on me. And a lot of her impact was getting me into the mindset of like long-term practice that, that really stabilized my joints. So I was this yep. super handy person who practiced all the time. Right. Um, 
And she also warned me. She said, you know, Patabi Joyce hurt me. And that had a huge impact. And I was really angry that she told me that. Because then I got to my story. I was like, I didn't come here for the first 10 years because she said that. And then finally, you know, 14 months ago, I wrote to her and I was like, Mati, you have had such a huge impact on me, but I wasn't able to really own that and acknowledge how important you were for me and her nurturance and her, her example. Um, and then she was gone. And, you know, she wrote back, we had this amazing exchange. And I just felt like we really closed that loop of at least me being able to thank and welcome her into my, my energy field. Cause I, you know, there had been, I think this internalized misogyny of not really, like not really accepting her sort of mothering energy in my life. Um, so I think Mati is just huge for me, even though we never had the, what I had with Dominic was this feminine nurturance of, he came into my life in 2006 and he just held, like and saw me so clearly and really nurtured me in a super gentle and feminine way. Um, but Mati had been there before. Yeah. Yeah. And then she, I mean, some of you may not know this, she brought, uh, I guess, so it was a real loss to the- Yeah, it was a real loss at a, at a time when she, oh God, what if she were still with us? Someone asked about what to do with all of this scream time in these they're spending so much as i like to call computasana <laughs> what do you have any cues to counter uh this computasana that we're constantly doing um, I have first of all that you my, answer this. <laughs> my 2003 era blue blockers uh, this, is, this is the person my students see. have had those on the whole time <laughs> and i actually love the like like cyberpunk old school version of the blue blockers they definitely help um yeah. but i've also kind of migrated my work into this um 2d flat platform and i encourage my students to communicate through me with me to share and so like the world just knows like my email response time one month two months uh so i'm not trying to keep pace with the old capitalism like standard of like really being there to like, you know, I don't, I don't read my push notifications on social media. I just, I don't feel responsible for that stuff. Um, and so like challenging the rate of like keeping up with the internet that we might have that's carryover from like the capitalism standpoint mm -hmm. and just like changing the rate. And I've actually told my students, like, I don't think it's healthy to to try to be on the instant message paradigm i will answer like even their direct messages in our in our platform every seven to ten days you know like let's actually change the pace of things and i think that's also just a really good way to make sure you don't feel obligated to the screen i got a garden like i'm obligated to like taking care of the lettuce <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it loves you back, I'm sure. Uh, well, I haven't ingested it into my system yet, but I look forward to that greatly. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a nice, someone, quick question. Do you recommend travel to India to learn? Oh, well, okay. So this is actually a question that came up last week when um, I was talking with my student Bota in Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I think we have to get really real about the, the political and health and economic limitations of travel to India. So this is yeah. something I've done every year since 2009 with the exception of this year. And I find it extremely, like it's my connection with the source of my work as well as, you know, just the chance to, to rejuvenate and be happy with our teacher. Um, but the world has changed now. And, you know, that's an economic and political and health sort of set of concerns. So my answer is, I just don't know. We need pilgrimages and we need to like do things that remind us that yoga is from India and we don't know what it is. Like you and I were both very clear yeah. that we just know this much of the tradition. Yeah. And so there, there's a thing that happens if you travel to study instead of to party. And plenty of people travel to India to party. It's not helpful. 
um, when you travel to study, it humbles you and you realize you have no idea what it is. So how can we find the, that like connection with source and, and the sacrifices that you make because of pilgrimage in like right now? I do not know. I just don't know. But I think that's a, a serious question so that we continue to work with the colonialist mindset. Yeah. Right. And work against that idea that like modern yoga is a thing that's like somehow discontinuous from its Indian roots. Like, no, that's just imperialism. Right. The question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just a couple more. Do, how do we work to prevent over attachment into the practice? Um, this is coming up for someone. I, I guess they feel like they're having, you know, hard time sometimes even not even i can say on my days off yeah. practice can be hard and i have to just make sure that i maintain and keep those days as rest days because my body needs to do that and so for me i had to learn a balance was necessary but right. what, are you, what are your thoughts i think i think that's huge and um, those of us who menstruate yeah i practiced on my menstrual cycle at the beginning because i thought that was feminist there's this other kind of feminism that's like, whoa, like up and up, like getting excited about up and up, like the downward energy and recognizing that it's always like, you're only going to have as much prana as you do up and up. And that goes for all bodies, not just the menstruating body. Um, but, you know, I've actually, uh, I've been reflecting right now on that bifurcation, like 10 years into the practice, I started teaching and I think that when the, when the practice needed to start in some, you know, you and I, when we're in Mysore, we get up at two. Yeah. Um, when we're at home, we get up between three and four. And that really chipped away at, and also it snows six months of the year in my town. Yeah. <laughs> right? so that kind of chipped away at the idea that practice would be super pleasurable. Um, and like, added resistance which is like interesting and that also happened in my 30s mm -hmm. but i would say practicing in my 20s in los angeles the levels of attachment and like reactivity to the practice were pretty strong and i don't know really how to address that other than to to recognize that it's there and for me the form of reactivity was not you know reactivity has like two poles like there's the the anti the pushing away the the pain and the attachment to pleasure and like equanimity has as much to do with with that craving and attachment to pleasure as the rejection of pain and I think very often like early in the practice because it's so amazing it was so awesome the attachment to the good feeling can at least for me that was what was blocking my equanimity and my spiritual insight and and what cured me was getting up at two in the morning <laughs> so like i don't recommend that but maybe recognizing that if you're super attached to the practice that is as you know that is as far from equanimity as being like at war with the practice um and just working with that idea of surrender and uh, uh, you can still have it but you just like maybe don't get to grasp it so much yeah. yeah, it also is that Adidya, Smita, Raghavesh, Vinivesh, Klesha, like that fundamental misknowing that you think that that self existent thing, even yoga, is going to fix you, you know? So that misknowing that there's this thing out there that's going to fix me or heal me or, or hurt me that's independent on its own, coming from its own side, has its own <laughs> nature. So. Yeah. Uh, it's our filters, yeah. Yeah, then a lady asked, it was kind of similar about um, how, to, how to balance different practices such as asana, breathing, chanting, study, meditation, et cetera, with time and, have, and be left to live and create. Um, and this is Lydia, who also is in a deep householder's practice with her wonderful children. Um, I do think that the, I, I don't have a, a universal comment on that other than I would say that my entire work as a, as a mentor is really around that. It's like figuring out what is the, the practice, the kind of 
from a vinyasa karma standpoint that will support the life and that will now allow the life to be like spiritually rich and present instead of feel like it's uh it's competing with the practice like what's the practice that enriches the life yeah um so maybe just orienting the the structure of the practice from that question i think that you know once you've been on the mat for several years there's this inner teacher that's there you know that angela who was like five years into practice and very attached somewhere in there she knew we have like the knower we have the inner teacher who like can cut through our bullshit <laughs> right um and the student who's been on the mat for for a lot of years and has children i kind of tend to assume that they have a wisdom that i don't about like structure and i can be there to kind of reflect that back to them yeah yeah we did get to the inner teacher and outer teacher but we'll hopefully save it for another time i'm here for it um, yeah yeah let's do it um okay. so uh thanks everyone um yeah. lindsay has posted to the chat room and i'll let uh, lindsay take it away here i, I just want to thank all of you guys for showing up and coming to our practice and process series and we welcome Angela Jameson, and it's so nice to have her join in these discussions. Uh, she's such a gem. Yeah, so, much um, love to you all. Thank you. Thank you both so much, John and Angela. I really um, appreciated your warmth and this insightful conversation that you shared. And it was just wonderful to be able to um, participate at some level, um, to observe, to listen. And of course, we want to remind everyone that for today's program, we're encouraging donations to directrelief.org. And we also encourage you to visit the Contemplative Sciences Center website. The web address will be listed on the slide that will be posted in just a minute at the end. Um, we hope that you'll learn more about our work and if you're able, consider making a gift to help us continue to share these important resources to the UVA community and beyond. And of course, last but not least, please be sure to join us next week for our conversation with Kate O'Donnell. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.